On September 20th, 1414, an extraordinary gift showed up at the court of Yu Di, the Yunlai Emperor of the Chinese Ming Dynasty. The gift was nothing less than a Qi Lin, a magical creature of Chinese mythology that was said to represent an auspicious sign. This exotic animal, an example of which had baffled the Romans when Caesar brought one back from Alexandria in 46 BC, represented a unique emperor among the Ming Dynasty and an extraordinary age of Chinese exploration that is little remembered here in the West. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In 1271, Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan's grandson, formally declared the Mandate of Heaven, proclaiming a new dynasty in the traditional Chinese style. The Yuan Dynasty would rule China for nearly a century, but in 1367 the fall of the city of Suzhou represented the end of the Yuan Dynasty in China, and a new dynasty, the Ming, was proclaimed under the Hongwu Emperor, although the Yuan continued on the Mongolian Plateau as the Northern Yuan Dynasty. International trade had flourished under Yuan rule as the Mongols reopened the Silk Road and trade flowed into China's ports. But as a December 1992 issue of Natural History notes, the trade routes were controlled by Arabian, Persian, and Indian merchants. Private Chinese traders had been barred from traveling to the West for several centuries. While international trade flourished in a time that included the travels of Marco Polo, foreign traders were given more freedom than the native Chinese under the Yuan Dynasty. But it was the Ming Dynasty that replaced the Yuan under the Hongwu Emperor where isolationism ruled. For much of their 276-year reign, the Ming ruling dynasty sought to limit foreign influence in China, including maintaining the prohibition against private foreign trade by Chinese merchants. There were many reasons for the famous isolationism of the Ming dynasty. The dynasty was constantly beset by external threats, especially the still existing threat from the Yuan dynasty in the north. China was a large country with little need for foreign resources or technology. And under the Ming, there was a revival of Neo-Confucianism, an inherently conservative philosophy. One example of this isolationism was the so-called Sea Ban, which restricted private maritime trading and coastal settlement as a response to Japanese piracy. Because, of course, don't all good stories involve pirates? But there was a notable period under the reign of the Hongwu Emperor's son, Yu Di, the Young Law Emperor, when China would focus externally and the emperor sought to extend China's influence in the world. Unusual in an era when China was becoming more and more closed, during this reign, China would become the world's foremost maritime explorer, all under the command of an extraordinary admiral. A 2020 edition of National Geographic writes, In order to dominate the trade routes that united China with Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, the emperor decided to assemble an impressive fleet, whose huge treasure ships could have as many masts as necessary. The man he chose as its commander was Zheng Ha, in her 1989 book, Before European Hegemony, sociologist Janet Abu Lugold notes, The impressive show of force that paraded around the Indian Ocean during the first three decades of the 15th century was intended to signal the barbarian nations that China had reassumed her rightful place in the firmament of nations, had once again become the Middle Kingdom of the world. Zheng Ha was a court eunuch. Eunuchs, men who had been castrated or more often emasculated, had been in use in the Chinese civil service since the 3rd century BC Qin Dynasty. Emasculation was often required for high-ranking civil servants because, being incapable of fathering children, they would not be tempted to seize power and start a dynasty. Court eunuchs became very powerful under the Ming Dynasty. A 1961 article in the Sinology journal Taung Pao explains, Given the nature of autocracy, it was logical that power would be delegated to those the emperor felt would represent only the interests of the imperial family. Eunuchs appear to meet this criterion. The website History of Yesterday says of the great admiral, Yung Ha rose to incredible heights from incredible lows. National Geographic notes, perhaps it is odd that China's greatest seafarer was raised in the mountains. The future admiral Yung Ha was born around 1371 to a family of prosperous Muslims. He spent his childhood in Mongol-controlled, landlocked Yunnan province, located several months' journey from the closest port. Born a Muslim, Yung Ha was a descendant of a high official from the Yuan dynasty. Captured by the Ming in 1381, History of Yesterday explains, Like many at the time, he suffered a most unfortunate fate when they decided to castrate him at the age of 10. He was made a member of the eunuch class and put in service of the prince, Yu Di, who would later rise to become the Yung Law Emperor. Young Ha accompanied the prince on expeditions against the Mongols and was given military training. A giant of a man, court records suggest he was seven feet tall, he earned the prince's trust 
and served during the prince's rise to power in a campaign against his brother between 1399 and 1402. In exchange for his service, the new emperor elevated Young Ha to the title of Grand Director, the highest rank for a eunuch. And in 1403, when the new emperor ordered the creation of a large fleet to extend Chinese influence, Young Ha was given command. The purpose of the so-called treasure voyages had to do with the Yongla Emperor's vision for China. The Columbia University website Asia for Educators explains, The Yongla Emperor was particularly aggressive and one of those in other countries to be aware of China's power to perceive it as the strong country he believed it had been in earlier Chinese dynasties. He thus revived the traditional tribute system. In the traditional tributary arrangement, countries on China's borders agreed to recognize China as their superior and its emperor as lord of all under heaven. These countries regularly gave gifts of tribute in exchange for certain benefits, like military posts and trade treaties. In this system, all benefited, with both peace and trade assured. For ocean expeditions to the south and west, he decided that China should make use of its extremely advanced technology and all the riches the state had to offer. Lavish expeditions should be mounted in order to overwhelm foreign peoples and convince them beyond any doubt about Ming power. For this special purpose, he chose one of his most trusted generals, a man he had known since he was young, Yong Ha. The size of the fleet was, by all accounts, massive, dwarfing the efforts of later European explorers. A December 1992 edition of Natural History magazine explains, A huge fleet left port in 1414 and sailed westward on a voyage of trade and exploration. The undertaking far surpassed anything Columbus, Isabella, and Ferdinand had ever envisioned. The fleet included at least 62 massive trading galleons, any of which could have held Columbus's three small ships, on its decks. The largest galleons were more than 400 feet long and 150 feet wide. The Santa Maria, Columbus's largest vessel, was about 90 feet by 30 feet, and each could carry about 1,500 tons. Columbus's ship combined could carry about 400 tons. More than 100 smaller vessels accompanied the galleons. All told, 30,000 people went on the voyage, compared with Columbus's crew of 90-some. The largest of these Chinese treasure ships carried five masts, Reportedly more than 460 feet long, they were, possibly, the largest sail-powered wooden ships in history, described by the University of California at Los Angeles International Institute as the size of a small World War II aircraft carrier. Some modern scholars question whether the ships could have been as large as Ming records claim, but National Geographic notes, even so, a recent discovery by archaeologists of a 36-foot-long rudder raises the possibility that some ships may have been as large as claimed. In addition, National Geographic writes, there were also mid-sized ships used for transporting horses and a multitude of other vessels carrying soldiers, sailors, and assorted personnel. Some 600 officials made the voyage, among them doctors, astrologers, and cartographers. Historian Edward Dreyer of the University of Miami noted in his 2007 book, Yung Ha, China and the Oceans in the Early Ming Dynasty, the fleet left bearing imperial letters to the countries of the Western Ocean and with gifts to their kings of gold, brocade, patterned silks, and colored silk gauze, according to their status. Encyclopedia Britannica writes, He commanded the largest and most advanced fleet the world had ever seen. The voyages were intended to display China's power and culture and bring foreign treasures back to the Ming court. An account, dated 1419, from the Rasulid dynasty in what is today Yemen, wrote of the tribute, it was a splendid present, consisting of all manner of rarities, splendid Chinese silk cloth woven with gold, top quality musk, storax, a type of rare tree resin, and many kinds of chinaware vessels. However, the goal was to extract tribute in return, as Rasulid scholar Ibn al-Dayyab later wrote, Young Ha had an audience with al-Malik al-Nasir without kissing the ground in front of him, and said, Your master, the lord of China, greets you and counsels you to act justly to your subjects. While contemporary Chinese teaching presents the voyages as peaceful exploration, a July 2010 BBC article notes that some experts disagree, noting that the historical records show that treasure fleets carried sophisticated weaponry and participated in at least three major military actions. The ships returned home filled with envoys and gifts, tribute from the lands visited. Among those gifts were exotic animals. The report by the Rasulid dynasty says the Sultan sent gifts in return, including wild animals such as oryx, wild ass, thousands of wild lion and tamed cheetahs. But it was on the fourth of the seven great treasure voyages of Yung Ha that a truly extraordinary animal was acquired. History of Yesterday writes, While the first three journeys of the Ming treasure fleet were primarily to extend and submit Chinese power and control to the waters directly surrounding southern China and her neighbors, the next three expeditions would focus on expanding Chinese reach to some of the farthest points it had ever reached. 
The fourth expedition launched in 1413 and pressed on past Calicut. This time the treasure fleet would reach Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, the farthest the Chinese fleet had sailed up to this point. The website Face to Face Africa describes a part of that voyage. Part of the fleet led by Commander Zheng Ha reportedly sailed to Bengal in India, where they met envoys from the African coastal state of Malindi, now part of Kenya, in 1414. The Kenyan magazine Uwa elaborates on the encounter. Sometime in 1413, sailors from Malindi arrived at the court of the King of Bengal, India, with a host of tributes. Among them was a giraffe. At the same time, an accomplished Chinese admiral heading an expansive armada also arrived and sent emissaries to the Bengal court. The Chinese sailors witnessed the gifts the powerful sultan of Malindi had sent and became fascinated by it. Noticing their intrigue, the wily king of Bengal re-gifted the Chinese with the animal the Malindians had brought, and with it started a legend. Natural history continues. The giraffe that travelers saw in Bengal was already more than 5,000 miles from home. Been brought there as a gift from the ruler of the prosperous African city-state of Malindi, one of the several trading centers lining the east coast of Africa. Malindi is midway along modern Kenya's coast, three degrees south of the equator. Yung Ha's diplomats also persuaded the Malindi ambassadors to send home for another giraffe. When Yung Ha returned to Beijing, he was able to present the emperor with two of the exotic beasts. A pair of giraffes in Beijing in 1415 was well worth the cost of the expedition. A translator for Yung Ha described the animal. The head is carried on a long neck over 16 feet long. On its head it has two fleshy horns. It has the tail of an ox and the body of a deer, and it eats unhusked rice, beans, and flour cakes. He apparently exaggerated the length of the neck. While giraffes can be 16 feet tall, their necks are usually around 6 feet. But the value was shown in what he called it, using the name Chi Lin. A 2013 edition of Science News notes that Chi Lin are one of four mythical beasts in Confucian tradition, along with the dragon, phoenix, and turtle. And Owa notes that for the Chinese, the Chi Lin represent the presence of a sage of wisdom and benevolence. But, Science News notes, Chi Lin are creatures that are known as Chinese unicorns. They're most like a cross between a horse and a dragon. It doesn't sound much like a giraffe, but Uwa contends. The male of this species had two or three horns, a deer's body, cloven hooves, the tail of an ox, and sometimes the scales of a fish. The giraffe ticked most of those boxes, including being graceful and largely peaceful animals. Uwa continues. Moreover, there was good reason to call the giraffe a Chi Lin. To finally own something even remotely mythical was a definite win for any emperor, and the dream for most. Although he was said to downplay the mythical connection, according to a June 2017 edition of Smithsonian Magazine, of all the animals that the emperor received, the giraffe was the one he asked a court artist to paint. And a 2004 edition of the Medieval History Journal explains that that portrait seems to have been intended to reinforce the connection to the Chi Lin. The painter, Shen Du, made the association between giraffe and Chi Lin explicit, both in the style of the painting and in the poem inscribed at the top. Shen Du painted in a delicate, refined style, giving the giraffe a benign, gentle face, a delicate and slender body with a detached, otherworldly majesty. Its spots are no longer spots, but are transformed into a fish-scale motif that is characteristic of the Chi Lin. The reason, Science News suggests, might be that the Yongla Emperor had a legitimacy issue. Yang La became the emperor when he raided Nanjing with an army of several hundred thousand men and set fire to the palace. His brother, Yan Wen, the second Ming emperor, was accidentally killed in the fire, or so the Yang La emperor claimed. Yang La then took his place. But as a fourth son, he may have felt the need to buttress his claim. In fact, he rewrote official history to leave out Yan Wen. Uwa notes that the animal was feted, even, to some level revered. For years, the giraffes from Malindi were displayed on the east side of the throne during imperial functions. The giraffe, therefore, served to reinforce both the legitimacy of the emperor's rule and the wisdom of his famous treasure voyages. When does a giraffe become the combination of a horse and a dragon? When it serves the emperor. In all seven great Ming treasure voyages occurred between 1405 and 1433. And the scope of these voyages was truly remarkable. Six decades before Columbus would cross the Atlantic in three boats that were so small that purportedly all three could fit on the deck of just one of Yung Ha's great treasure ships. Historians argue that the voyages established cultural connections, altered maritime trade routes, and potentially facilitated the rapid entry of European commercial enterprises into the Indian Ocean region during the second half of the 15th century. But they were not the last. Chinese rulers eventually decided that internal concerns were more important and slipped back into isolationism. The last voyage concluded in 1433, 
nine years after the Yongla Emperor's death. Science News writes that Yong Ha's magnificent ships finally rotted at their moorings. No record has been discovered that explains the fate of the Emperor's giraffes, the mythical Qi Lin that so represent a golden age of Chinese exploration that has now faded almost into forgotten history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.